Good morning and welcome to our webinar on blockchain and smart contracts. My name is Jo Willems and together with my colleague Jonathan van der Stichle, I will give you a practical and legal perspective on blockchain and smart contracts. Our webinar will last, I think, uh, 45 to maximum 50 minutes. And before we start, I will give you some practical information. You see the slides on your screen if everything goes well. But you can also download the slides on the right hand side under the section handouts. Um, you can also ask questions um, to, using the chat function and we will uh, answer these questions after the webinar or you will at any event receive by email an answer to your questions. Also during the presentation we will launch two poll questions. These will not be uh, very difficult. Um, but when you answer these questions, you will receive a certificate from GoToWebinar, and this may also be useful. So let's start and start with the overview, what we will uh, discuss today. First, uh, I will give a short introduction to the topic, uh, why this topic, why we have chosen this topic, why it's relevant and important for the daily practice, not only the commercial practice, but of course also for the, both the commercial and legal practice. And we will also discuss the topic from a uh, practical, uh, legal and commercial point of view. Then I will uh, pass the floor to Jonathan, who will explain to you in the most comprehensible terms what blockchain just means and more importantly also what are smart contracts, what's the difference with the traditional legal uh, contracts. Then I will discuss the smart contracts from a legal uh, perspective where I will focus on the legal difficulties or what we see nowadays with regard to the application in the legal industry and the legal practice of smart contracts. For instance, I will refer there to uh, the hardship clause, for instance, the incorporation of such a hardship clause in a smart contract, but also other non-operational clauses. And then uh, Jonathan will give you some uh, real life smart uh, contract applications in different industries like the insurance or the transport or the fintech uh, sector. And he will conclude the webinar then but giving his final considerations on the topic, what we have learned uh, today. So to introduce the topic, the rise of blockchain technology, uh, as you may know, blockchain is still a very recent phenomenon. It only dates back from uh, 2008. It was invented in, in uh, 2008 as the basis for Bitcoin. And that's the reason also that the words blockchain and Bitcoin that they are often uh, used together. But after the Bitcoin, when it was not only connected to uh, blockchain, people began to see the innovation and the value of the blockchain uh, technology separately from the uh, Bitcoin platform. And in the recent years, and that's also why we're dedicating a, a webinar on this topic, we have seen a significant uh, rise in the use and application of blockchain technology in different sectors and industries all over the world. The continued interest uh, and rise of Bitcoin lies in the important uh, qualities and properties that other technologies cannot offer to such uh, extent. For instance, security, because it's all online. Of course, you have a security risk with regard to the hacking of such a system, uh, but that's less or the uh, risk are less than with the regular system. But it also has new qualities, like there's no uh, central authority. It's completely decentralized when you have no authority governing uh, the system and there's no need for such an authority. Uh, the application are no mostly cryptocurrencies. So the major applications of blockchain today, these days are cryptocurrencies, but also to a lesser extent, NFTs. Uh, the blockchain technology then finally shows an entirely new and important uh, potential. But there are still a lot of issues, of course, involved with this new technology as well. And this is certainly the case, as we will discuss later on, the legal uh, perspective then and the legal difficulties from a legal or even also from a regular uh, regulatory point of view. And I will further elaborate on that. But I will now first give the floor to Jonathan 
to explain to you what blockchain is and also give more insight about smart contracts. Thank you, Jo. Good morning, everybody. Also, welcome from my side. I will discuss with you firstly today what blockchain actually is, how does it work, how is it created, and I will then go on to the concept of smart contracts, namely what it actually is and what its properties and advantages are. A blockchain can be defined as a digital, decentralized, distributed public ledger of transactions. This is one description, this is one definition, but there are many. But what do all these terms actually mean? A blockchain, in essence, is actually a data bank, a ledger of all the transactions that have occurred, and that is visible and accessible to all the participants in the blockchain system. This blockchain, this ledger, this combination of all the data is distributed over an indeterminate amount of computers. In the context of blockchain, these computers are often referred to as nodes. And all these different computers hold an exact copy of the data bank, so of the blockchain. A blockchain is also decentralized, meaning that all participants have in principle the same rights, and there is no central authority that governs access or uh, controls the transactions. And lastly, the blockchain is digital, is software and code, and no physical copies exist. All these properties that I have just discussed are actually the properties of the most common forms of blockchain, and are also the properties of the oldest and the longest blockchain to date, namely the Bitcoin blockchain. But there are other types of blockchain possible too. For example, you could have a private blockchain instead of public, and this means that the participation is not open to everyone, but limited, for example, to the employees of a certain company. Not every blockchain has to be decentralized. It could be that certain participants have more rights than others. To the contrary, every blockchain will be distributed and will be digital. So this is basically what the blockchain concept entails. Now to actually the most difficult part, the complex question, what is blockchain and how does it work in essence? How is it created? This is a very essential question that lies at the very foundation of understanding the concept of blockchain and smart contracts and why it has these properties and advantages. So let's get started. Firstly, a transaction is requested. For example, A wants to send 10 Bitcoin to B. This transaction needs to be authenticated. Authentication will take place via a private and a public key. Every participant in the system has a private and a public key. The public key are is widely shared with others in the network and the private key will be kept secret. The combination of these both keys actually creates a digital identity in the systems and allowed for, allows for authentication, namely who sends what to who. Although they are called keys, they can actually not be confused with the password to your account. Without getting in too much technical detail, how does this authentication work? A transaction is, for example, encrypted with a private key and then it can only be accessed by the receiver with the corresponding public key and vice versa. So we have a transaction, it is authenticated. Then we, the transaction needs to be validated. Once the transaction is authenticated, it will be sent to all the different computers in the network. Each of them will validate this transaction. They will verify if A has 10 Bitcoin, if that's okay, it is valid and it can be processed further. If it is valid and it is in conformity with the rest of the blockchain, it will be included in a block. This is where so the basic of the word blockchain comes from. This block includes multiple elements. Firstly, the block will include the data of this transaction as well as multiple other transactions. For example, the Bitcoin blockchain can hold up to 100 transactions per block. Each block also contains a timestamp, namely when the block is created. And each block contains a unique fingerprint called the 
hash. How do you create this hash? This is created by putting the data of the block into a very specific formula, which then results in a very unique long string of numbers. So, like I said already, this hash is unique to every block. Because if you would change the data uh, of the block, the final hash will change too. And finally, each block also contains the hash of the previous block. This is where the, the second word chain comes, comes from. Because every block is connected to the pre previous block by references, by reference to the previous block in this chain. If you would change one hash of one block, for example, by changing the data or fraudul fraudulently change the receiver of a transaction, then the hash will change and all the following blocks in the chain will become invalid because the chain is interrupted. So we have the block here that is created. Then we come to the final phase of the blockchain creation. In a blockchain system, each computer actually creates separately its own block of valid transaction. So it is perfectly possible that one valid transaction is included in more than one block. So how does the system then decide, or how does it reach consensus, on which block will be finally added to the blockchain? This is where the consensus mechanisms come into play. These consensus mechanisms were invented together with blockchain and Bitcoin to prevent that two blocks with the same transaction would be included in the blockchain, which would lead to uh, double spending or double payment of the same amount. The two most widely used consensus mechanisms are proof of work and proof of stake. Short explanation, proof of work entails that all the computers try to solve a complex puzzle to find the hash of their own, of their own block. They actually try to hack it and uh, guess the code, the fingerprint of their own block. And the computer who finds the answer to their own block first can validate it and gets to place the block on the blockchain. In turn, this computer can uh, receive a reward, for example, uh, a number of bitcoins. This proof of work, because you're digging, you're searching for your code, is also referred to as mining. So that's where the word bitcoin mining comes from. Another consensus mechanism is proof of stake. This means that an algorithm will randomly select one computer which can validate a block and place it on the blockchain. And the more stake you have in the system, the more coins you have of, for example, blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, the more, the higher the chance will be that you can validate the block. So this is actually how then the whole blockchain uh, is created. Before we continue, one final point regarding the environmental impact, actually, of the consensus mechanism, and most notably the proof of work consensus mechanism. Because the finding of the hash of a certain block is actually a race between all the computers at the same time. They all try to guess. Uh, they hack the, the hash of their own block, and it takes a lot of energy for a computer to do that. The more powerful your computer is, the faster you will uh, get the answer to your puzzle and the faster you can move on to the next block. So the combination of ever more computers and ever more powerful computers actually leads to a very large environmental impact due to the very large energy consumption. There was even a paper of the White House of this summer 2022 that estimated that the total yearly energy consumption from blockchain mining would exceed the annual yearly consumption of contracts, uh, countries such as Argentina or Australia. So you see, it uses a lot of energy. Here is the final summary uh, of the complex creation of blockchain. A wants to send money to B, the transaction is authenticated and it is sent to all the different computers in the network. The transaction is validated, it is included then in the 
block with other transactions. The network then will approve on a block via the consensus mechanism. It is included in the blockchain and the transaction is final. So now that we know how a blockchain works and how it is created, what are its properties and advantages? First of all, it is decentralized. It means no central authority exists that controls access to the blockchain or has to approve the transactions. This means that there is no trusted third party necessary anymore, such as banks, other financial institutions, lawyers, notaries. The system itself um, excludes the need for a third party. A blockchain is also immutable. It is permanent and cannot be modified. A blockchain is transparent because every participant has access and has a copy of the digital ledger. And one of the most uh, notable properties is that the blockchain is secure. All the records are individually timestamped, they are encrypted, and they are included in the immutable and transparent blockchain. At least this is the basic idea, and it is quite a quite strong idea. In practice, it shows as well it's very secure, but there have been hacks in the past often due to hackers exploiting coding errors in uh, the blockchains. Now we come to our first poll question. One of the advantages of blockchain is the low environmental impact. Is this correct, incorrect, or does this depend on the blockchain? The question is now open. Welcome back, everybody. We will now show the results uh, briefly of the poll. Here you see that 65% says incorrect, and this is the correct answer. 22% says it depends on the blockchain, which is actually also correct, because indeed it depends on which consensus mechanism is used. So very good, everybody. Then we come to the topic of smart contracts. What is a smart contract? It can be described as a digital contract that is expressed in computer code, which automatically executes and enforces predetermined set of contract terms. More simply put, it means that contract terms are agreed beforehand, they are uh, included in the code, and the software makes sure that it automatically executes. The most simple form in terms of logic is if or when this happens, then that should. The concept of smart contract is actually not new. It has existed many years before the invention of blockchain. A vending machine and a parking meter, only a few examples, are smart contracts. If the condition of money is satisfied, then you will receive the product or parking time. And this, uh, you will receive this product, product or the parking time automatically because the machine or the meter has been coded like that. Now, what is the smart contract then in terms of blockchain? This means that the contract terms are included as a block on the blockchain, and the execution of the contract terms is automated via the blockchain protocol. This concept of smart contracts has actually, in the recent years, um, been revitalized through Bitcoin, because a Bitcoin transaction so many Bitcoin from A to B is actually one of the simplest forms of a smart contract. What are the advantages of smart contracts and what are its properties? A smart contract on the blockchain is predefined and it is self-executing. This means increased efficiency, speed and predictability. Because of the self-executing character, no breach of contract is technically possible. A smart contract is immutable. A transaction or modification that was not agreed by the parties will be rejected. So a party cannot can no longer unilaterally modify its terms. No trusted third party or intermediary is necessary anymore, perhaps like we have seen before. Because of the automation and the self-execution, banks, lawyers, agents, all these middle persons are in principle not necessary anymore, which then in turn leads to a high cost reduction. Now, finally, the smart contract code replaces the need for governing law. What is meant by this is that the a contract 
will not be concluded because the last has its contract or because the last has these are its consequences. No, the contract will be concluded and it will be executed because, because it was agreed like that and because it was defined like that by the smart contract code. So in that sense, the code is the law. We will see, however, that the matters are not so simple. I will now give the word back to my colleague, Jo Willems, who will discuss with you smart contracts from a legal perspective. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, the smart contracts from a legal perspective, uh, there are many things to say about, but I think we sh should start with the difference between a smart contract code and a smart legal contract. A smart contract code that is the code that is written on the blockchain to create a self-executing uh, contract. While a smart legal contract that can or should include, and we will see that later on, uh, the smart contract code, but that's the contract in the legal sense. And we have seen already uh, that smart contracts have the potential to function as legally binding uh, contracts and that technology has been accelerating innovation in the legal industry. Uh, we can refer there to e-signatures uh, for binding legal agreements, which we are all using now since uh, COVID. But smart contracts, they represent another development, a uh, new development in the space, and may soon be then an option for parties uh, to legal uh, agreements potentially lowering the cost incurred from uh, not only using other intermediaries, but also for using uh, lawyers. So lawyers' fees may also substantially be reduced because of uh, smart uh, contracts. So if we look at the smart legal contract, what is important there, of course, just like for a regular uh, legal uh, old-fashioned contract, the will of the parties will determine the contract. There, the will of the parties, what are the parties looking for? What's the main object or purpose uh, of the agreement? And of course, there should be uh, an agreement between the parties, which means that there will be an offer from one party, which has to be accepted. That's the same for a regular agreement. That's the same for general terms and conditions. Also for a smart legal contract, there will be an offer. Uh, and there will be an acceptance of this offer by the other party. Also, the basic contract requirements uh, of the legal contract uh, uh, could be met, but the legal and practic reality is uh, more difficult, as we will see later on, because it's not only the offer and acceptance, but it's the uh, expression and execution of the agreement that is uh, most difficult. If we go on, then we will see that the next problem is uh, reading uh, computer code. And reading the computer code is, of course, uh, complex, as not anyone has the capability of to read a computer code. The understanding thereof is, however, necessary for the functionality and use, and not only from a legal perspective, because that has some requirements, but also from a commercial and technical uh, perspective. And in order to understand the code, the smart code, uh, completely, and therefore also the smart contract, uh, one must also know the properties of the host system, the infrastructure, and of course also the blockchain technology itself. Without that, it's impossible to conclude a smart contract. And if we put the complexity aside, the computer code is still, of course, a language, but a challenging language to read and understand. There are multiple code languages, and I hope that I pronounce them uh, correctly, but uh, they are like Solidity, Plutus, Simplicity, and there are multiple blockchain platforms, each with a different uh, code language and the code. And the most, uh, what we all know, is Ethereum and Solidity, but you also have Solana, Cosmos, and uh, Stellar. It's not only the parties or the third parties who will have to understand the contract, but also, and that's most uh, important also uh, for our industry, that if we agree on a smart contract, if parties agree on a smart contract and the discussion, 
about this uh, smart contract, the interpretation thereof, the execution thereof, the validity thereof, that the court equally needs to read and understand uh, a contract. The smart contract could be void uh, for uncertainty otherwise. And it's not only that, but also a court should be able to settle uh, a dispute and for that it will have to be informed and understand the context of a contract. It's a possibility, uh, a future possibility, to refer smart contract disputes to specialized chamber within the commercial court and with either judges or experts who know to translate the code. I think also what we see nowadays uh, when complex uh, litigation or disputes are referred to arbitration, I also believe that arbitration could be also a perfect match for this type of contract where you can appoint then also dedicated and specialized arbitrators. Of course, the computer code requires a knowledge of the code uh, and the technology and uh, the uh, infrastructure, as I already said. Also, the assistance of experts uh, may be required. And for example, it can be useful to perform an audit of the smart contract code before entering into the uh, final agreement. But the problem with the third party expert may be that they don't have the legal experience and that there therefore is a need for uh, an audit before concluding a, a smart contract. Last but not least, what is important of course and why this matters, reading and understanding the computer code is to uh, assess whether there has been consent and agreement reached which is, of course, the most important condition in order to have an agreement, also to have a smart uh, contract between uh, the parties. Next, we have then uh, writing uh, in code. And that's also, of course, uh, quite complex in a smart contract because you have there two types of clauses. You have operational versus non-operational uh, clauses and for a contract to be inserted into blockchain all the necessary legal wording has to be translated into computer code into the smart uh, code an operational clause is a clause which can be easily translated into code and a basic example is when if something happens then uh, something else uh, will happen when you pay a price, then you will receive a product. This is quite simple and these two types of events can easily be linked. Non-operational clauses, on the other hand, are broad and vague, uh, most uh, on purpose. They have long sentences, uh, ambiguous uh, terms, uh, legal, techni uh, technical, archaic language, and uh, these cannot be translated into code. And uh, I can refer to uh, force majeure and hardship uh, clauses, but also choice of law, complex obligations with standard of servants and uh, selection of choice uh, or dispute resolution clauses where often reference is made not only to courts, but also to arbitration or to uh, summary proceedings. Now, the interpretation is of course, also important of uh, these uh, clauses and also of the other clause of the agreement. For example, when does performance become burdensome or important in, course of, uh, of, in case of force majeure? When is a service considered sufficient or reasonable? And what is actually the best effort, uh, the completion of such a best effort obligation in the given circumstances? These can all be considered, I think, as non-operational clauses. These clauses cannot be uh, omitted because just because they are open and vague uh, terms, the interpretation is inherent to a contract and that can be adapted, of course, to changing uh, circumstances. Again, there's a need for experts here as legal uh, professionals are usually not coders themselves. I'm not in any event. And coders normally don't have a legal background. Therefore, a certain level of trust as well as expertise need to be maintained to ensure that all parties can trust uh, that the code within the smart contract truly reflects the legal content and purpose. And last uh, but not least, the difficult 
capacity for the multitude of provisions for, for example a dbfo contract or general terms and conditions this will be very difficult to translate this all into smart code so this is one of the legal difficulties that we face with the smart contract code and to translate it into uh, a smart uh, legal uh, contract next we have then the fact that the contract is immutable and this means that the contract is included on the blockchain and cannot be changed uh, or terminated because it's quite like the word say immutable it cannot be changed you cannot alter the provisions it's a contract computer code so this cannot be easily uh, changed or not be changed and therefore it's very important that the smart contract should from the beginning include all potential future scenarios and circumstances i believe that this is quite impossible to provide uh, that this uh, will also all be provided in the agreement you can of course uh, provide for some circumstance like for instance uh, if in a certain type of case the temperature will be below 20 uh, degrees Celsius that something will happen and that this constitute a force majeure but you cannot provide or stipulate all possible uh, circumstances this is extremely difficult for long-term contracts where circumstances change and we have all seen it in the recent uh, times and months where there was a significant increase uh, of raw materials of course this especially for long-term contracts where you want to have uh, or trigger uh, price uh, revision clauses this will be difficult in uh, smart uh, contracts a solution for this problem may be that uh, the parties can rely on uh, a possibility to integrate a so-called exit or kill switch in the design of the smart uh, contract and there the parties can modulate uh, the conditions for killing uh, the contract for example by submitting the switch from a contract or the change for a contract to the agreement of all the co-contractors or certain trusted uh, entities for instance the external users operating in the decentralized uh, system or institutions that can be an option to make or to uh, realize a certain change uh, to the smart contract however it's immutable and this may be also have a positive but also a negative uh, aspect what we see next is then the fact that the law is not adapted to smart contracts yet and we see there that code law is the code is law is not advisable nor would uh, be accepted why is that the case because not all obligations can be expressed in computer code as we have seen before it's very difficult to address a force majeure or a hardship clause or a best effort clause in computer code Net, and uh, the second uh, reason is that not all rights obligations and scenarios can be regulated beforehand this is the same as now of course and therefore the law is important for subsidiary legal uh, protection i believe also that the lawmakers and regulators would not allow that such a system would remain un unregulated and that not it would not be governed by any uh, sufficient uh, at least minimum uh, legal protection because codes law is not possible or advisable and the law is not adapted yet to smart uh, contracts there's also of course a potential loss of protection of legal protection uh, uncertainty and issues with execution conclusion is there i think that contract law will or should apply to the smart contracts but it's difficult and uncertain application of the current legal uh, framework there's therefore potential loss uh, of legal uh, protection legal uncertainty or issues with execution and i think that we need the law still for subsidiary legal protection in case essential contractual elements are not or cannot be concluded in the contract so now what are the examples of the legal difficulties for instance the first uh, thing is who is liable if the smart contract does not uh, function if there's a breach of uh, contract <coughs> sorry 
um, is that the programmer, the expert advisor, the provider of the smart contract uh, template, the owner programmer of the blockchain uh, system are the parties. Does a smart contract satisfy the definition of writing, for example, for evidence uh, purposes? What of mandatory clauses cannot be included in the smart contract code? That's also a question. What's the place of the execution uh, of the contract? For example, to determine the competent court in the context of the Brussels 1 uh, regulation. What happens if a contract uh, is null and void? For instance, that there is an error or that, that there is fraud or that you want to terminate the contract or, as I already said, force majeure. And then last but not least, of course, in the in the public blockchain, there's also data which are incorporated. What are the rules on GDPR? How can that also be dealt with? So there are different uh, legal difficulties which still has to be uh, taken up and uh, be uh, governed and managed when dealing with uh, smart uh, contracts. Next, we see also that there are a lot of current and future legal initiatives. We have the European regulation on market and crypto assets. That's a MICA. It's not yet approved, but entry into force foreseen for 2024. And there are many other study and working groups regarding blockchain and smart contracts. Um, and these are called the ELI uh, principles. These principles are designed to establish a common understanding of blockchain uh, technology and smart context in the co of smart contracts in the context of civil law aspects and also designed to guide legal professionals when applying the existing legal framework to blockchain technology and smart contracts and also be a source to inspire future developments of the law by courts or by the legislator these are not yet uh, binding but a good step in the right directions. We have also seen that many countries worldwide are gradually adopting a new legislation, like in Italy, in uh, the UK, they have three types of contracts. And um, there you also have the hybrid contract, where, what I will discuss on the next slide. But we also have new definitions of writing in the Belgium. In, in Belgium, you have that. You have a new book eight in the new civil code. There's a new definition of writing. And in Dutch states, in the geheel van alphabetische tekens of van enige andere verstaanbare tekens. But this, this, however, does not apply to software code. And you see there that authors propose best practices to minimize the risk in the absence of uh, an already existing regulatory or legal framework. <coughs> then what is also important is that the functionality is limited to blockchain uh, environment. In order to determine whether the conditions for performance of a smart contract have been met, secure data from outside, input uh, from the ledger, will often be required. The same goes for the performance of actions in the outside world when the predetermined conditions have been uh, met. So the systems that connect the blockchain environment with the outside world are called oracles. You see that also on, on the slide. And the oracles will still be necessary in order to make sure that the smart contract can uh, function uh, in practice. So these are called uh, oracles. And the fact, of course, this has an impact on the functionality while it's limited to blockchain environment, there's still a need from outside uh, factors or criteria or intermediaries. So now what's a solution uh, for the legal uh, problems that we have uh, faced? We have seen that there are many issues with smart legal contracts, both from a practical and legal perspective. One solution for most or many of these issues is the dual contract uh, model. These, this is the two contracts uh, that together form the smart uh, legal contract, a contract written in natural uh, legal language, and then uh, a contract written in uh, computer code. So this is a combination of the both of them. Then there are two options. The first one is dual contract model mirrored. This means that the full contract is expressed in code and separately in natural legal wording. 
it is not practical or possible because many uh, non-operational clauses, as we have seen, still cannot be drafted in computer code. So you cannot uh, incorporate it then or reproduce that in legal uh, uh, wording or in, uh, no, in uh, computer code. So this is not possible for the non-operational clauses. The hybrid option is then that the contract is partially expressed in code and partially expressed in natural language, both complementary. This is that this means that a traditional uh, contract that functions as main contract together with a separate smart contract that executes performance of that contract. The traditional contract will then be the legal wrapper of the or the overarching uh, agreement. The smart contract will then be the contract concerned with the performance or the uh, main uh, parties uh, or the main obligations of the parties concerned and will be the essence uh, of the agreement. There are no longer mirrors as in the first option, but complementary parts of a uh, wall. They are complementary in the sense that both are equally necessary, but not uh, complementary in terms of uh, content. And then both the traditional main agreement and the smart contract form part of the same economic unit. I believe that this is possible, but uh, that specific rules may be required to govern such hybrid or mirrored dual uh, contracts uh, in the future. I will now pass the floor back uh, to Jonathan, who will launch the second poll questions, which related to oracles, which have been discussing as the limitation of the blockchain to the uh, environment. Thank you, Jo. Before we continue with the last part, we have the second poll question here. Namely, oracles in a blockchain context are either blockchain innovators, computer systems for creating blockchains, or systems to provide input or output for the blockchain. The poll question is now open. Votes have been in. We will show uh, quickly the results. We see that indeed systems, uh, oracles are systems to provide input and output for the blockchain and the vast majority of you had uh, voted on this correctly. We will now continue then. Smart contract applications, the final part. We will discuss some applications that are being used at present um, as well with some applications that are more being developed in theory. First, in the context of insurance, smart contracts can be used as automated insurance policies, also referred to as parametric insurances. This means that insurance payment of a claim or the provision of coverage depends on predetermined external events, indexes, statistics, you name it. So without human intervention or judgment of the insurance company, you could automatically receive payment or Two examples are uh, included on the slide. See, AXA Fizzy developed a smart contract that um, included that if a flight was delayed for more than two hours, you would automatically receive compensation. This product was, however, discontinued in 2015. A company that is still developing today uh, these automated insurances is Aetherisk. It's actually the first completely decentralized insurance company. This company uh, provides automatic claim payment and coverage in case of drought, flood, or fire. Another example where smart contracts could be used is for paper use insurances. This means that the use of a product would automatically trigger coverage. For example, you drive for Uber or with Uber, or you drive for Deliveroo, or you rent a car. The moment you step into this car until the moment you exit it, you will receive coverage. One company that develops uh, automated paper use insurances is Intelias, who's actually right now developing such uh, car insurances for one of Europe's uh, biggest insurance companies. Another sector where smart contracts could be used is in finance and investment. We have seen already that smart contracts can be used for a simple transaction of money or here cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin or an Ethereum transaction is a smart contract. 
Another application is for decentralized venture funds. The most notable example of this is the DAO. DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. I must say that the DAO no longer exists to date because it was the victim of a famous hack in 2016, but nevertheless is a perfect example of what smart contracts are capable of. In essence, the DAO platform would allow anyone with a project to pitch their ID to the community and then potentially receive funding. Everybody who had um, tokens, who had coins in the DAO system could vote on the plan and uh, if the plan received a profit, they could uh, get a percentage of the profit. What is so special about this is that it's actually a venture fund that was owned and organized by all the participants of the system and was not governed by, for example, the board of directors. Another example of smart contracts is decentralized lending. One company who specializes in this is Compound. This actually allowed any person on the Ethereum blockchain to deposit cryptocurrencies and receive an interest for them and other people to borrow at the same time these cryptocurrencies against an interest. This is all automated without the need of um, banks or financial institutions in between. Smart contracts can also be used for crowdfunding. Let's say you have an agreement between the developer and an investor that if the required financing would not be completed, the investor would receive a full refund of uh, his money, or if the investment is completed, it would receive a percentage of the profits. All of this could be automated, and there would no longer be need for the intervention of third parties who govern this whole transaction. Kickstarter, for example, is developing smart contracts exactly for the purpose uh, that I have just discussed in terms of crowdfunding. Real estate also shows a lot of potential for smart contracts. Blockchain can assist with notary deeds. Why is the, the function, um, the authority of the notary assisted with by blockchain? Is because information can be very efficiently and easily verified because it would be included on the blockchain. The identity of the parties can be proven easily by the public and the private key, and the notary deed can afterwards again be stored on the blockchain. I have to admit, this is not really a smart contract. It does not automatically execute, but it's very noteworthy to mention it here in the context of blockchain. Another very useful application is the simplified transaction of real-world assets, such as real estate. How will this take place on the concept of smart contract? First of all, you will need the tokenization of this asset, for example, this house. Tokenization means that you make a digital representation of the real, the real estate and you will include it on the blockchain. This block, that is the token, can include all information about the real estate. For example, uh, the current ownership, the past ownership, record, certificate. It can all be safely stored on the blockchain. If there is then an agreement between a buyer and a seller or certain conditions are satisfied, the smart contract could execute and the real estate could be transferred to the buyer via the transfer of this token. So in this way, you re reduce the need for lengthy and costly registration processes going to the notary. All of this could be automated while still having the security and the safety of, the safety of your transaction. Two companies who specialize in this are, for example, Solid Block and Realty. In 2001, Lydian has actually assisted the startup of Emo Tokens, a company that specializes in this tokenization and the transaction of real estate. Smart contract applications go a lot further, for example, in terms of healthcare. Let's say you put your complete medical file on the blockchain and you uh, write a smart contract that says, after so many months, uh, you will receive an automatic prescription for your medicine, or let's say your blood level rises uh, to this level, or your cholesterol. In that case, you also get an automatic prescription. So you reduce the need for uh, to go to the doctor for these little things. 
Another very interesting theory at this moment, a prototype, is a blood chain. What if you could trust a drone to help transport blood from the donor directly to the victim? Let's say you register as a blood donor, uh, there, an accident happens, the drone immediately flies to your house, picks up the blood straight from your body, it will be then delivered to the victim or to the relevant hospital via planes, via trucks, whatever. All these steps could be included on the blockchain and could all be automated without the need for parties to be present for every single step. The final sector we will discuss for smart contract applications, media and IP. Smart contracts could help with the automated compensation of artists, directors, after streaming or purchase of their media. It could automatically track media use, sources, IP infringement, and also uh, by this reduced privacy. On the slide, you see three companies that actually specialize in smart contracts and media and IP. Digimark is a company that tracks the music sources, IP infringement, uh, how many streams there are, and then provides payments to the artist. The same goes for Media Chain, it was actually recently bought by Spotify. Media Chain issues smart contracts to artists uh, that include that based on the amount of streaming, the artist will automatically receive royalties. Then you have a very interesting company called Royal. Royal actually allows people, such as you and me, to invest in a song and uh, then they receive a percentage of the royalties of that song, depending on how many times the song is streamed. What is interesting that this can be developed in the context of smart contract, because before this would take a lot of time and energy and money to um, create such a simple obligation with a small payout. But with smart contracts, all of this can be automated and it allows for a lot more opportunities. Here we see a chart from the Ethereum blockchain and we see that the daily smart contracts that are created on Ethereum between 2001 and, 2000 and uh, 2021 and 2022 and further has actually doubled. So smart contract applications are definitely on the rise. Then we come to the end of our webinar, some final considerations. The blockchain is a revolution. That's at least the idea of the blockchain community. The idea is to revolutionize the whole current economic system in all different sectors. We have seen it, healthcare, insurance, contract law, real estate. They want to apply the blockchain system everywhere possible and make everything more efficient and secure. So they tend not to limit it to, for example, cryptocurrency transactions. But as we have seen, we cannot forget that the blockchain and smart contracts are still in early development. They only existed since 2008. There's still a lot of trial and error, but more and more companies are getting involved with the improvement of blockchain and the invention of new applications. So you have also seen it will be important that regulators will provide the necessary legal framework. But at this moment, we see that they adapt gradually or even slowly. Knowing the reg regulators around the world, they will eventually catch up. So this was it. Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the webinar, or at least that you learned a thing or two. And we also hope to see you back for future webinars about blockchain, smart contracts, or similar topics. Yeah, we see, you. yes, uh, I will now give the word to you um, regarding some questions. Yes, uh, received a lot of questions, but uh, we're nearly the end. Uh, I think only two minutes uh, of the webinar, the dedicated time. So we will provide each of you who has uh, sent uh, or dropped uh, a question uh, in the chat box. We will send you an email, uh, provide you with an answer by uh, email. So also from my end, thank you very much uh, for your participation to this webinar. 
Uh, we hope to see you back in January and we wish all of you uh, a happy new year and our best wishes on behalf of the Lydian uh, and Lydian's commercial litigation department, the best for the next year. Thank you and see you in January.